so, so happy to see all these wonderful faces in this room and all these smartphones in the room. I hope you will all be live tweeting the proceedings. Um, please, if you are live tweeting, do use the, uh, the hashtag, which is written up on this blackboard for you, nice and handy. And uh, there is also the password to the public Wi-Fi. Uh, 22 innovators 22 will probably crash it and it's not the greatest connection but give it a go um, so I'd like to thank all of our panelists and our moderator for taking time out of incredibly busy schedules to be here and participate in this conversation um, I'd also like to thank a number of sponsors and contributors who without them you know this really wouldn't be happening um, so CSI, the Center for Social Innovation, it's the space that we're sitting in right now. It's a beautiful space, and they, in addition to giving us the space for free, they also equipped us with uh, some of their amazing staff to help out. So thank you, CSI. Uh, I'd also... I'd also like to thank Steam Whistle for providing us with the beer that we will be drinking after the panel. Uh, the beer is free, just to let you know, but you know, don't go crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd also like to thank Justin Drew, who made our logo. Uh, he did a really, really great job in a very short amount of time. Um, also, Jin Quist Designs, which put together our poster. Arcana PR and Consulting, which hooked us up with some great swag. Um, and uh, Wendy and Christina at the back, uh, and they are whipping up a feast for you later, um, so I'd like to thank them. And uh, Toronoist for doing the live stream, and that means that there are so many more people who can be a part of this conversation. So thank you, Toronoist. Um, now, uh, this idea, it was born out of a conversation that, uh, that I had with Neville Park and a couple of other Toronto politics tweeters. Uh, Neville Park wrote a blog uh, called Too Many Dicks on the Dance Floor about, um, about the gender split in the Toronto politics Twitter community. Um, and uh, Neville and I were discussing this blog and how it was kind of a microcosm of uh, the continuing underrepresentation of women in politics and discussions about politics. Um, so, particularly when it comes to the most influential players, there seems to be kind of an imbalance. Um, one thing that should give you hope, though, is the passion that, uh, that so many men and women clearly have for changing this reality. So, the people in this room and the people at home uh, are all working toward changing this problem. Um, and uh, it's important to note that this panel series came together with a tweet. Um, so a tweet was kind of what started it all, and uh, basically, uh, as Neville and I were talking, I just tweeted to Kristen Wong Tam and Shelley Carroll and a couple of others, would you like to be a part of a panel about women in Toronto politics? And I mean, these are women with like 65 hour work weeks on a good, on a good week. Um, and, uh, and quite instantly, they were really into it, and I think that speaks to a couple of things. Number one, um, the widespread passion to achieve a greater balance of gender in the political realm. And it also, I think, speaks to the power of Twitter to connect people around the issues that really matter to them. So um, I'll leave you with that, and uh, thank you all for coming, and enjoy the panel. It's a distinguished pleasure of moderating tonight's event. Um, I want to start by acknowledging and thanking and welcoming the men among us. Um, Kudos to all of you for coming, and thank you for being here. Um, I have to say it's very rare that I'm in a room talking about politics with uh, so many women, um, but I was also equally delighted to see men, so uh, hands up, hats off to all of you for being here as well. Uh, nothing uh, ever, I, I run an organization called SMARA that works on strengthening political and civic engagement in Canada, and so nothing warms my heart more than seeing a room full of people ready to talk politics. Um, so thank you again all for being here. Um, tonight, as you probably saw from the uh, material that Stephanie and her team put together, um, is really an exploration and a discussion of how women in the political sphere are being discussed in the media, um, social and otherwise, and, uh, and how they are otherwise participating or engaged in our public debates. Uh, we're going to talk about women in public life generally and define public life quite broadly. Um, it isn't just politics, but it's all of us who engage in the public sphere in some way. 
Um, the nature of the online and offline conversations and how they may or may not discourage or encourage or increase people's ability and capacity to participate and engage there. Um, we're very lucky, as Stephanie said, to have such a fantastic panel with us. Um, all women who in their own worlds are at the forefront, I believe, of uh, engaging people in city politics and in, in public life more generally. So I just wanted to take, before we dive into the discussion, I just want to take a moment to introduce everybody. Um, starting on my far right, by the way, I once read that women are not as good at directions, like it's actually been proven. Um, so I always have to do L for left, even still, so <laughs> just embarrassing, but I do. Um, is uh, Hemantal Dotan, who uh, wrote the most beautiful bio, and I'm going to read it. Um, she was born at Mount Sinai, raised by the lake, and studied at the University of Toronto, but didn't realize how much Toronto was part of her until she left to live in other cities. Uh, the, this, the contrasts were illuminating, and she's very happy to be living here once again. Um, she's the editor-in-chief of The Torontoist, Thank you for the live stream. <laughs> uh, where she also sneaks in as much writing about City Hall as she can manage. Uh, she comments on local politics on CBC's Metro Morning as recently as this morning at 6.10. I heard. I was not awake. Um, and has contributed essays in several books, uh, in several books at Coach House's Utopia series. Uh, she also thinks that cities are best discovered on foot. So thank you for being here. Uh, next is Kristen Wong Tam, uh, the city councillor for Ward 27, Toronto Centre Rosedale, um, where she was elected in 2010. A uh, real estate professional and, uh, in reading her background, a consummate social entrepreneur from, I think, far before we'd ever invented that term. Um, Kristen's been involved in developing or championing all kinds of things, from social planning programs, arts endeavors, farmers markets, affordable rental housing, heritage protection, uh, and I could go on and on. Uh, she's also a longtime human rights advocate, co-founder of Ch Chinese Canadians for Equal Marriage, and served as a president of the Chinese Canadian National Council's Toronto chapter. Thank you for being here. Um, next, Chi Chi Lam, uh, oops, sorry if I did something wrong there, uh, who I've actually done a project with uh, entirely online. Uh, and so tonight is the first day we say we've consummated our online relationship <laughs> by meeting in person for the very first time. Um, and I'm not sure if someone from Sound can tell me to do something. Yeah, purple haze. Um, <laughs> so Chi Chi has a specialist degree in English from the University of Toronto and uh, B.Ed. from U of T as well. Uh, she's an educator in her day job uh, and in her night job too, I think, uh, which is how we first met, uh, rabble rousing uh, online. Um, English, uh, she teaches English politics and world issues with the Toronto District School Board. Uh, and this means she's got a tremendous amount of opportunities to see what kind of impact uh, decisions have on the young people that live in Toronto. Um, some of her happiest civic moments have included serving as a member of the Toronto Star's community editorial board, uh, using Twitter to connect with other politics geeks, um, including me, <laughs> uh, and honing her ability to maintain the lines of communications with, individual, with, uh, with individuals whose ideas about the world are different from her own. Um, and then immediately to my right is Shelley Carroll, a city councillor for Ward 33, Don Valley East. Um, first elected in 2003, uh, she's dedicated to creating a more inclusive city, uh, one that's not only more economically sustainable, um, but also environmentally friendly. Uh, she's been chair of the Public work, Works Committee, um, the city budget chief, among numerous other contributions to our city. Um, she's lived in Don Valley East since 1967, which is also Canada's centennial year, uh, which, where she was active in the school system, including serving as a school board trustee in the Toronto District School Board. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming and thanking our panel. Society's way of deciding how it will live together. Uh, and in my opinion, it is one of the most important uh, endeavors uh, of, our, of our human life. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to jumping in. Um, so I'm not going to delay beyond just give you a bit of background on how the night will unfold. Um, first, I'll, I'll kick it off by just asking some general questions to the panel just to get the conversation going and getting some ideas out on the table. Um, I know that you'll all oblige in keeping your answers to about two minutes each. Um, <laughs> uh, then I'll turn it over to you for a question and answer. Um, we have to have everybody asking questions into a microphone, of course, because it won't get picked up on the live stream otherwise. So if you do want to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you and someone will either bring you a mic or will ask you to come up and speak 
uh, into a mic up here, depending on, on how that goes. Um, we also have uh, two wonderful live tweeters in the corner, Laura and Emma, who will also be fielding some questions that we're receiving from the Twitter team. Um, third, we're going to just ask a couple of closing questions and seek some advice from our panel. Um, and then lastly, we will turn it over to the entertainment uh, portion of the evening for food and drink. Um, so thank you again. Uh, so here we go, and we're off. Um, the panel, of course, as everyone knows, is really seeking to explore the role of women in our political conversations. And of course, it's premised on the fact that there are uh, women there to participate in these conversations. Uh, and then, of course, despite the gains that women have made in many areas of society, in politics in particular, uh, women still remain underrepresented. Um, not only in political office, but often, at least in my anecdotal view, in public policy debates as well. Um, it's true, of course, in many parts of the country and including here in Toronto. Um, so what I'd like to do is just open this panel by asking our panelists, um, Shelley, if I could trouble you to start, um, just given your respective role and vantage point, um, a few comments on what you, how you see the state of women in the public sphere today. Um, how would you characterize things and why? Um, what are some of the things that you find very encouraging? And what are a couple areas that you think really still need attention? And then we'll just go down the road. I think you'll have to oh, I'm using this one. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if mine has less feedback. We're, we're, we're getting a, a very interesting echo up here. Well, the State of the Union in two, two minutes. Um, uh, uh, just before uh, we started on the national scene, uh, things are looking up. Uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're only going to concern ourselves with numbers, the numbers are getting better and better because uh, we achieved our 30% in, in council. Uh, many of you will have read, whether through Twitter or, or hard copy newspapers, that New Brunswick's municipal elections province-wide uh, brought them to 30%. When, uh, when we get to FCM this weekend, we'll be celebrating that at, in the Status of Women Committee at the, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, because uh, that is, is their goal nationwide, as well as really the goal for any municipality, the women in government take that back with them from FCM. But uh, really, I think the thing we have to talk about tonight is, is build upon the things that we talked about uh, uh, in, in the first uh, Women in Teal Poly uh, discussion last week. Because while the numbers are there, how we function once we get there is a real struggle. Uh, how do we fan out throughout the organization? What, what committees do we populate? Uh, is that a struggle? I don't think anyone uh, in this room will have forgotten the inaugural night of, uh, uh, of this particular term of office when suddenly the, uh, the chairs of the committees for the City of, of, of Toronto were, were asked to step forward and have their picture taken with the mayor. Uh, and, and that little photographic uh, session gave everyone in the gallery on inaugural night a moment to realize they're all men. Uh, a couple of days later, there, were, there was then through the democratic process, Councillor Stintz was appointed, but the rest were all men. And that wasn't even the case in the last many years. So uh, without looking at some of the things beyond just the numbers we get into office, unless we start to build in certain filters uh, into the actual governance process and the decision-making process around appointments, we can find ourselves from time to time taking two steps forward, two steps back. That's one of the things I will bring to the discussion at FCM because we would hate to see that happen in New Brunswick. It's, it's a real leap for them to get to 30% across all municipalities. But if you're taking two steps back by giving none of them chairs, what have you achieved? District School Board, but just who happens to be an employee of um, an institution that is very near and dear to my heart. In fact, a number of my colleagues from the TDSB are here tonight, and I encourage you afterwards to have a chat with them about certain courses that our students don't necessarily find particularly engaging. However, according to the requirements um, for graduation in Ontario, you have to take civics. One of the challenges that I have as a civics teacher in the past is to make sure that women feel validated in the classroom. There are a lot of differences that I notice as an educator in the way um, students come to our classrooms and learn. And civics is one of those interesting areas where girls are very active 
in expressing their opinion, in asserting the fact that they have a civic responsibility to become involved with city building, neighborhood um, enhancement, but then something happens along the way and we don't see these same assertive, well-spoken young women going into politics. Even if we don't see them going into active politics, such as Councillor Carroll or Councillor Wong Tam, it would be nice to see them coming out to um, support a candidate, going door to door during elections, even getting to the point where they're voting. It's very distressing for me as a um, politics teacher to learn that students after the election, um, the last municipal election, come to me and admit, maybe I should have voted because I'm not happy with what's happening in my city now. What can I do? It's too late for me to actually put in a vote. I don't think it's ever too late uh, to prepare for the next election. I don't think it's ever too late to ask challenging questions to representatives who happen to be in positions of power, whether they're women or men. And I don't think it's difficult to have a conversation with someone who disagrees with you. The worst thing that could happen in our climate of uncertainty is to stop having dialogue and to stop having civilized conversations. And I would say, even if I can dare venture off into the province and, and the federal level, is that uh, things are not looking good. And uh, the reason, largely because it's the polarization of, uh, of, of political ideology. And I find that it's, uh, it's a politics of division right now that seems to have sort of engulfed our city. And, uh, and that's not really uh, where women like to operate, from my experiences. Women are generally collaborators. We do try to work together. We often try to find the middle ground. And, Currently, the, uh, the environment is not conducive for that type of decision-making and, and governance style. So until that changes, and, uh, and we have to make it uh, forcefully into a change, um, I think that it's going to become harder and harder for women to enter uh, civic life and political life, uh, largely because it's now become that polarized environment. I don't want to paint an environment where it's all doom and gloom. I do think that there is opportunity for us to change the dialogue, but it has to happen in a grassroots way, and it has to happen um, in, a, in a place that uh, empowers women and girls. And I bring up the issue of uh, women and girls and political identity uh, and gender equality quite a bit at City Hall, because I think it's very important to to find that place and to wedge yourself in there, even if the space, the space does not permit you, uh, and it's not necessarily welcoming. Um, but it can change. I don't mean that as a throwaway field of mine. I'm encouraged by this because we're having, we're starting a conversation, not just about the problem, but about some underlying causes of the problem and what we can do to try systematically to change it. And I think that's the sort of the biggest challenge that we face. We all know what the numbers are. We all know that they're not right. We all know of individual cases of women candidates that have been helped out or that have been shut out. I don't think we have as good an understanding as we need of what the systemic challenges are and what the solutions systematically are to help mitigate those. So I'm thinking of things, for instance, in the States you have something called Emily's List, which is a foundation that was set up to help political fundraising for women very early on in their political careers so they could get a leg up when they really needed it and they were trying to get established. And that's a kind of systematic intervention where you're trying to change not individual cases, but the political structures and, and the way the whole electoral dynamic works. I think we need a better understanding of what we can do here, what those opportunities are here to change things, not in any particular election cycle, but to eventually make things like this irrelevant because women have been fully integrated into the electoral system. Debates are they inclusive? What images are we sending of our politics through the media? Um, you know, how are women, being, young girls, being uh, discouraged perhaps from speaking vocally as they get older? Um, which kind of raises a second set of questions, uh, which is really, uh, in a similar way, a bit of a state of the nation question. Um, but how do you feel women are being represented and discussed in our political debates? And in particular, given the um, Twitterati nature of this event. I'm particularly interested in your comments about whether the, some of the new forms of social media uh, and other kinds of communication tools are, are actually helping or maybe even hindering um, diversity of voices. Are they providing improved access for women? 
uh, to contribute, so, uh, why, and why or why not. So really just back to the panel, a bit of comments on sort of the, a bit more uh, exploration of the culture of our politics and the role of the media and the images that might be uh, presented there and how that might be influencing some of the things you raised at the beginning. Um, who, would, who would like to go first? I can start at the end again, but you, uh, maybe I'll pick on you since you are in the media. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how lucky for me. Um, <laughs> I think it's a double-edged sword. I definitely think because there's an ease of entry, just sort of technically there's an ease of entry with things like social media, just the numbers are going to go up by sheer force of that accessibility. And so you have more people in general commenting on City Hall and finding out about City Hall, and so you're going to have more women doing that as well. I think that as some women in, involved in, in sort of in Twitter in Toronto can attest to, there are some risks, and one of the risks with social media is that you become a target very easily for a lot of fairly vicious, anonymous attackers who are going to go after you, not necessarily for the substance of your opinions, but for your identity or anything they feel like picking on. And that is something that historically and still today disproportionately targets women. There are women who have started commenting on trauma politics on Twitter and have had anonymous handles, they haven't gender identified because of this, and some of them are still not identified, some of them have come out over time as women, and that has taken time. And the fact that you need to go through a process of coming out as a woman on Twitter, because that's a thing, is worth pausing and pondering for a minute. Oh, and for the kids, to the two counselors, Long Tab and Carol, how are you finding um, Twitter and social media tools I impacting your relationship with your constituents, your communication with citizens in Toronto? Or you can ignore that question and answer the earlier one. <laughs> well, it's it, it, you're, you're going to find that there's there's a bit of a contrast between how how it works for me and how it works for, for uh, Kristen. Because uh, my constituency, uh, my, my elected constituency, I have the pleasure of serving a neighborhood whose average age is much older than, than that of uh, Kristen's constituency. And so um, their, their, uh, their numbers in the, in the Twitter ad I are, are much lower. So for me, Twitter is, is a way to target a very specific group. I'm not going to get a cross-section of my ward, but it is a way of trying to, to invite them to the rest of the city. Um, my, I, I got on Twitter in the first place because it seemed like this very downtown thing, the positive things, the things I try to go to uh, in my Twitter conversations or what's going on in the city that we should all be taking part in, which means you should leave the confines of your ward from time to time, maybe even venture south of the 401, uh, possibly even end up south of St. Clair. So I, I, I use it for that reason, to get people to fall in love with their whole city, not just what they can see from their picket fence. Uh, but, but it's, of course, branched into so much more than that. And uh, uh, in fact, is now a way of making sure that those people understand why it does take 65 hours a week to do the job. But I will say this, um, when people do gender identify on, on uh, Twitter and let me know who I'm talking to, I find that helpful. But I, I'm surprisingly disappointed in it at times. I think it's where we should be having this conversation about the role of women because you can. And it's where you can quickly in 140 characters call somebody on something. Uh, and, I, and I'm always surprised at, at how short-lived calling, calling some of our colleagues on, on uh, um, sexist or misogynist remarks. Uh, it happens quickly in short bursts and then it's over. Um, we are still hearing on a regular basis from, from, from the, the current budget chief, anytime we venture into we should take care of society, that that's for widows and orphans. And Twitter doesn't go ape every time he says that. And I'm, I'm disappointed every time. What a horrible thing to say. Oh, we, we can't take care of widows and orphans. I beg your pardon? I don't even get a Twitter that says I beg your pardon. Hashtag deal poly. Shouldn't I? <laughs> Shouldn't I? I? I don't think we use it nearly as much as we should to call people out on things like that. We get called out, heaven knows, by the cyber bullies that I haven't all mentioned, 
where's our cyber bullies? Why, why aren't we bullying the people that say things like that? Cyber fairies, perhaps. Yeah. You know, I really, uh, I, I came to, to Twitter very reluctantly at first, and someone a private individual, I tried to fly under the radar. It doesn't seem to be the case today. Um, but when I joined up for Twitter during the campaign in 2010, my campaign team really had to drag me kicking and screaming into it because I was so resistant. resistant. And I thought, you know, it, it doesn't seem too genuine to tweet things like, had a good meeting, and you know, how, well, I met these very fancy people. Um, and, and, but that seems to be what the electorate sometimes wants to know. What are you up to? So I had to, you know, get over myself and uh, and get into Twitter. And uh, and then once I discovered the power of social media, especially when it comes to Twitter, I realized that there's this whole new conversation that was taking place that I, uh, who was in my 30s at that time, I was unplugged. And so once I plugged in, there was a whole layer of conversation as an activist that I was really keenly interested in that I was out of the loop on. And um, I do really uh, cherish those spontaneous actions and movements that take place on Twitter based on the fact that someone had an idea, someone else gets to comment, and there will be trolls, there will be cyber bullies, and they will be out there for you. Uh, but as a longtime activist and a human rights activist, they've always been out there in one form or another. I have received uh, menacing phone calls and I've received nasty parcels based on you know, other issues that I've taken up in a position on, and, uh, and that was a very private threat. And so when the threats came at me, um, I would call the police and say this took place, and you know, someone would take a report. But now if I'm being threatened, and this morning I was actually called a, a cunt, if I can use that word, try not to, but someone on Twitter just, you know, basically labeled me that because of my position on the long gun registry. That was out there and everybody saw it. And so that is the power of Twitter as well, is that you also get to expose the, the nasty bits of, of people who are out there, and you know that they're all trolls. And, uh, and so the threats, although public, are, are public for everyone, and, uh, and you get to track it down. So that's the, the good side and the bad side. How are you finding Twitter is changing or influencing uh, your work, your interaction with your students, your students' interaction uh, with, with politics? Well, let me start by saying that one of the rules from the College of Teachers, which governs our profession in Ontario, is no social media usage with our students. It's considered inappropriate contact. Um, there are guidelines that are printed on the College of Teachers website, and it's considered controversial. Uh, a number of us feel that social media is um, an important aspect if we're going to connect with students. I find as someone who's teaching world politics and world issues, change is incredible. Um, if you look back to 2011, and if you were going to identify the key political moments globally, all of them seem to cluster around October, November. If you were to try and name the top five news stories um, from a global perspective, most of your choices would come from that moment. It's hard, why I'm saying this is you really need to be on top of your game and understand how tyrants get pushed out very quickly. Um, change may not be happening fast enough. You don't want to appear behind the news. And I'm also, um, I'm also a news junkie. I didn't actually aspire to be a teacher. Um, I took my dad's advice, thanks dad. Because I, I can predict, if I had gone into journalism, I think I would have been applying for uh, the Faculty of Education at this moment because I would have wanted a, a career change by now. Uh, I think Twitter is something that I've embraced, but not necessarily as an educator. I've embraced it because I'm an introvert at heart. No one believes me when I actually say that, but I have these amazing conversations with people who I normally do not get access to. Um, and despite the fact that our counselors at the table have said that they've had to deal with some very negative influences, I think genuinely there are people who would love to have a, an honest, decent conversation with you about making changes, um, doing something that's going to not just benefit themselves, but for everyone else. I, I really am naive in believing that we are here because we want to improve the quality of life in our city. And last week, um, for the first panel, Someone remarked on how it was a very Toronto-centric thing to wear Toronto on our sleeve. It's not so much a matter of being center, at the center of the universe, it really is a genuine love for a city that's meant a lot to almost every person in the room. 
Well, on a similarly uplifting note, um, Shelley, you started this session um, by noting that we've actually had uh, as women, some success in the political sphere. Um, not only is New Brunswick now one-third women at the municipal level, but even here in our dear city, uh, notwithstanding the uh, imbalance in the chair positions, um, I think council is the highest number of women in the history of council, I believe, uh, today. Um, so, small celebratory moment. <laughs> exactly, here, here. Um, so I'm just curious, and, and Hannah Motel, this comes back to something you said at the beginning about what are some of these systematic interventions that we can start to think about to get those you know, numbers up even higher. Um, so I'm interested in comments from, from the entire panel on the factors that you think to date have been most influential in at least starting to, you know, nudge things in that direction. Um, the kind of actions, whether they're, you know, actual activities, changes in the way, you know, I mean, media is, very, is becoming increasingly dominated in the communications industry by women, for example. Um, the kind of actions and interventions that could help uh, advance women's uh, representation further. So I don't know who wants to start. Well, I, I may pick on you just because you raised it initially. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if uh, Kristen's uh, uh, mentees are here. Uh, uh, mine are tonight. Uh, Asia and, uh, and uh, Zuhal uh, are sitting a few rows back. Wave, ladies. Um, these women are, are, are regional champions. How's that for a, a mouthful? Uh, we talked about this briefly last week, uh, but uh, it's a, a mentorship program that women in council are doing. And while it was organized by, by uh, uh, Councillor McConnell with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, it's interesting to note that young women in Toronto themselves were asking for this simultaneously. I showed up we, to the, women, uh, the Women's Council lunch uh, back in uh, 2007 with some women from, from the Toronto Youth Cabinet who wanted to start a mentorship program with women in council and, uh, and said, can I, can I let these kids come into our, our monthly lunch and, and uh, just talk for 15 minutes? And Pam said, they don't need to, we're doing this. What, what is going on here? Um, it's just that, that, that the need was obvious and, and the idea of Show them, show them your lives. Show them what what it is you do, and and they will take it from there. They may redefine it. Here's how I approach the role. Here's how Kristen does. But a next generation of uh, municipal politicians may take a different approach to it. But at least they'll have some framework to look at. And it has been very effective. We had to take a break last year because. Uh, um, the question of whether or not there would be staff support for, for such a program kind of was obviously a question in a new uh, administration, but we're back on track. That's, that's the good news, and, and, uh, and most of us have, have, have two mentees because the demand is there, and, and there are that many extraordinary women who are coming into an interest in politics. Um, how they connect up and how they form the bridge between a group like this uh, women in Teo Poly, a lot of academic base in it, a lot of media base in it. We try to be geographically representative in that group. So what you may find in those regional champions is uh, a building liaison group, the conduit between the suburbs and the downtown. People whose activities are spanning from City Hall right back out to where they live. And that may be the bridge that we've been looking for so that we can get to the point where anywhere in the city of Toronto it is okay to have a conversation about Toronto. We, we, we aren't embarrassed to say we love this city anymore. I think we've got some catching up to do. That's why I tweeted out the three things for Calgary site um, and I think I, I think I even put uh, women in Teal Poly as one of the hashtags to it to give people something to think about beforehand. What if you were allowed to talk about three things you would do, not that I would do, that you would do for your city. And what if you did have a Twitter address where you were just supposed to go and tweet things that you love and things that you could make better? That's the kind of conversation they're having in other cities. So I, I think we got to call people when they say, oh, you want to just talk about how you love Toronto. Oh, here we go. Um, I don't think that is uniquely Torontonian anymore. I think people have learned that that's uh, a more constructive way to engage in municipal government because it seems to be popping up all over North America. Starting from the positive, what can you build? That's what the conversation we're trying to have with our regional champions. It's the electronic conversation we're trying to have. And if we don't get back there in this city, uh, the real change we're looking for doesn't happen. Yeah. Other, other 
comments. Maybe Chichi, I'll pick on you next. Um, uh, just other sort of thoughts or observations or factors that you think have been influential in increasing, um, you know, ever, even though it may be slightly modest, the represent representation of women in public life. And I'm particularly interested in coming back to that comment you made at the very beginning about how you're finding people somehow, women, girls, are somehow getting discouraged. Uh, with age, and, and you also made a comment about civics education, and, and I think you said uh, it's uh, talk to us about the course that is the least engaging that people have to take. So maybe some comments there on the influence that that has on our overall cultural movement and politics. So one of the, one of the things that's happening at every high school around now is staffing, and uh, I've. I've been a member of the staffing committee at most of the schools that I've worked at and one of the things that I find very discouraging is using that 0.5 credit as a placeholder or as a plug for someone who doesn't have a full timetable. That is doing such a disservice to that course and I realize that civics is not a course that everyone want, wishes to teach. Um, I've met my counterpart um, which is uh, the 0.5 careers course that kids need to also take. I'd rather be boiled in oil than to teach the careers course. And that, that's, that's basically what we need to tell staffing committees, that if you find someone who expresses even um, a modicum of interest in teaching that civics course to 15-year-olds who may not be particularly interested in dusty politics at City Hall, because we know how tame City Hall is these days, we need to convince that person that they are the right person to teach civics, because you want someone who gets passionate, but you also want to make sure that you temper that a little bit. You don't want someone going into a civics classroom and trying to rush their agenda at a group of, of um, grade 10 students. That's, the quickest, that's also a very quick way of turning students off. If you're not listening to their ideas, but you're very quick to preach and to lecture and to deliver a message that they're not ready for, then we're not really doing anything that's going to serve our future well in terms of encouraging political and civic engagement. Um, I'm just going to squeeze one thing in, and that is I'm, it's good to know that young women are being mentored by people who are interested. Uh, if I were to talk about my own upbringing, did I grow up in a political family? Not really. But I will say that I, I'm of the generation of immigrant children who came during the Trudeau years. And you have to understand, any time my mother sees a picture of Pierre Trudeau or Justin, it's like she's talking about a member of our family. So, you must be John Mills. <laughs> um, you know, that, that's my political background, to be forever grateful for a decision that was made long, you know, decades ago. Uh, because that really affected my future as a Torontonian, but also my future in the global perspective. I'm just going to contrast that with a young woman who I taught two years ago who grew up in um, a staunchly liberal um, family. Her name is Maggie Conway. You can find her on Twitter. I'm sure she's okay with this. <laughs> Maggie Conway 15 is her, is her Twitter handle. And the reason I mention her is because she grew up in um, a liberal family, her, her uncle is Sean Conway, who was part of uh, the liberal cabinet from the David Peterson years, and he was the education minister. I only remember him because he actually signed my diploma when I graduated. So that, that's interesting. Like her, her upbringing, it's a good thing she didn't grow up you know, with a political belief system that she wasn't willing to embrace. But it, it's interesting to see that contrast. Some, some conversations are very natural in the family home, and others take a little bit more effort, such as the ones that took place in mine. So I'm sure Justin will thank your parents one day. I'm sure you choose to let them as a leader. Kristen, any, any thoughts from you on this subject of what's sort of changing and encouraging more about female representation? Um, I think uh, largely, I'm very, con I'm very fascinated by the concept of people in place, and uh, and what happens when you put people into a place, and then the conversations and opportunities flow out, and uh, and I find that you know where we are starting to congregate are, are actually places that uh, we normally would see each other in the parks or in the community centers and the shopping malls or what have you, and uh, and the conversations lead to usually what are you doing. Where, where are you going and how are you, what kind of neighborhood are you living in? And sometimes those, those particular questions being asked are the questions that will be the catalyst for action and change. And, uh, and I 
think what's really fascinating to me as I watch this, this dynamic sort of evolution of young women asking very good questions, they're very quizzical in nature, is that uh, they're also looking for their own answers. And if the answers that they find, they're not the ones they're seeking, they are wanting to change that world. And, uh, and to me, that's very empowering, especially as a, as, a, as a young feminist moving into my middle age, I think, um, because uh, it, it, hasn't always, uh, it hasn't always been that way. And I think that there is perhaps this resurgence of girl power or woman power that I'm now seeing is that women are, are very articulate and also very passionate about you know, how they want to, to build the world. And they know that certain rights are being eroded, like we are not building a national child care we are strategy. We are not uh, tr trying to, we're, we're, we're seeing the active erosion of, of sexual reproductive rights, and I think girls get that. Um, we know that there's a lot of victimization around, uh, you know, violence around women, and I think that women are also un seeing that and starting to unpack that. And there is this sense of, um, I, I think, a little bit of anger, but also a little bit of, um, of love that's wanting to propel people forward. And so I think that actually, instead of the electoral politics that we don't necessarily see women always running for office, we see a lot of women and girls engage in community building and neighborhood building. And that's another form of change in policy making, right? So that to me is, is, uh, is very, very encouraging. I like it a lot. <laughs> and remember, 40 is the new 20. Oh, okay. so yeah, sure, yeah. hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Hamilton, yes. over to you is on the same question, um, and in particular, interested in addition to answer it, if you could comment a little bit about, as an editor of an influential news organization, um, how, if at all, do you think about um, gender in your coverage of politics? So maybe just two questions to you, I guess. First is the one on the, you know, the, some of the changes you're seeing that might be at least nudging women forward, and then uh, just a couple of comments on the role of the media. Sure. Um, I'll talk about one very recent phenomenon because I think it sort of hovers in the background of a lot of these conversations, which is, for lack of a better term, the Rob Ford effect. Um, those of us who were following the budget debate last year spent a couple of all-nighters at City Hall. And for those of us who was there, there was one girl in particular. Her name is Annika. She was, I think, 14 when she deputed. She spoke at about 2.30 in the morning. She was in tears because she was terrified of public speaking. And she was there to ask that her library not be cut. And while it's very regrettable that someone needs to feel in that kind of distress, did feel in that case, in that kind of distress, she showed up. She was terrified and she showed up and she told the people in that room who had a tremendous amount of power that I don't know that they fully realized how it was affecting individuals like her, and she stood up for what it was that she needed as a member of her community. And there were a lot of stories like that coming out of the budget deputations, and one of the things that you know people are, are talking about a lot now is, has Rob Ford galvanized activism in Toronto in a way that you know, maybe maybe people were less motivated under David Miller because they felt that if you were concerned with social justice issues, if you were concerned about the role of women, you felt maybe like those issues were under better care in that old administration. I think that's bad. You need to show up no matter who is in office, always, and speak for what it is that matters to you in your elected officials. But I am very encouraged by the fact that so many women, and especially so many really young women, came and they spoke about their schools and they spoke about their libraries and they spoke about their after-school programs and all of these things and if that's the start of a resurgence it's unfortunate that they felt that kind of distress in the first place but if that's what gets them into the system good on them for showing up so that's an, an encouraging thing i think no matter who's in office no matter what your political views walking into city hall for the first time is scary and a lot of people are doing it now that haven't before. And a lot of women are doing it now that haven't before. As far as the media thing goes, uh, I'm not sure this is quite you were getting at, but it's the first thing that comes to mind, and I raised it in the Q&A last week. 
The most striking thing for me is how few women are commenting on City Hall. Newsrooms are split about 50-50 as far as reporting goes. If you look at the list of mainstream media, people whose job is City Hall columnists, they are almost all men. And Torontoist is an independent media organization, and if I were to show you the applicants, the people who say, I want to write about City Hall, they're almost all men. And so even with us, we are a smaller independent organization, we take these issues seriously, we write about these issues, we are still seeing that kind of imbalance. And so I will repeat what I said last week, which is, if you are a woman and you want to write about City Hall, send me your clips. Her email will be available later. <laughs> Uh, well, one last question to the panel before we open it up to uh, everyone else for questions. Um, and this is perhaps a, a slightly more personal one, if, if you will indulge. Um, but I'm interested um, in hearing from each of you how you think about your own role as an influential woman, whether you admit it or not. I mean, you know, women tend to not like to think about themselves that way. But each of you is important and influential in all kinds of spheres. Um, how do you, are you conscious of your gender at all? Um, why or why not? And does it influence, do you think, if you reflected on it, the way you approach your job? Um, I don't know who would like to start with that one. Shelley, <laughs> thank you for volunteering. Yeah. Um, I always count on you. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, to speak out about it because, um, you know, you, 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 you picture your, your male colleagues back at the ranch and what they'll say when you get back there. If you, if you say I'm conscious of it and, and I'm oppressed and all the rest of it, um, I know that I'll go back and, and someone will say, oh really? Because when, when you speak in council, I feel pretty oppressed. You, know, that, <laughs> you can hear that coming. And I really don't. Um, I, I actually approach the job as, as, uh, as if my gender doesn't matter. Um, and ironically, I got that uh, I got that from from hearing Hazel McCallion speak, who's pretty conventional in her views, and she kind of shocked me because she was giving a speech once to young women getting into politics that I went to as a parent activist at that point. She said, "Well, you gotta you gotta approach the job like a man and be better than the men. You gotta get up earlier and you gotta do your homework more than them, and you gotta read more of the report than they do, and be ready to do this, that, and the other thing." I thought that's I don't want to do that. I'm not going to surrender my gender at the door and become a man. Um, but that, I, that meant I, I also didn't want to go in as just the mommy. And, and I think that was what I made a conscious decision. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be me. And, and my gender is part of me, but my gender is not the reason I decided to get into politics. Oddly enough, my children is. But a man can get into politics because he's worried for his children just as easily as I can. So I don't think that made me a mommy. Um, uh, mommy in politics and only that. But at the same time, if, uh, if you ask people what's my brand, they probably would, would say that every once in a while she mentions her grandchildren and her children and it's about them. Uh, I, think we've gotta, I think we've gotta get over saying you're only allowed to say that if you are a woman. I sincerely hope that every man in council is there for the future of the city, is there for the next generation. All of them, uh, almost all of them are parents, almost all of them are grandparents, sadly. There aren't enough young people sitting in that room. Um, I think we're all there for that. But somehow when a woman says that that's why she's there, oh, that's her womanhood coming out. That should be the reason we're all sitting in the room. And that's what I'm trying to... Uh, uh, that's what I'm trying to evoke when I bring it up, when I'm speaking as a, as a politician. Because um, I, think, I think right now we're, we're, we're looking at, um, in that neocon uh, uh, revolution that's happening throughout North America, and especially at the uh, municipal levels uh, throughout North America, we're very, very short-term engaged. Everything is about the short-term. Um, and so today somebody said, well, this this transit thing you're doing takes a long time. It was somehow news to the mayor today that it takes a long time to dig a hole from one end of the city to the other and then lay down some cement and put in some track and actually get riders on it. That somehow came as a shock to him. When in fact, 
the conversation we've been having since I entered City Hall was about having a long-range plan and spending the next 50 years making sure we'll still be allowed to move around in the city and able to do it of our own volition by using mass transit. Uh, getting the long view in there means talking about other generations. My goal is to make it so that that's not a gender thing, to be having that conversation. My world's very different from, from City Council. I work in a female-dominated work environment, so the positions of power are often already occupied by women. Uh, the only thing I'll mention to that would be, if, regardless if you're a male who happens to be in power, or a female who's in power, use that for good. Use that so that you can help others, that you're not just getting into a position of authority and then sh not only shutting the door and locking it, but barricading it to everyone else who should have a chance to access and make decisions that, that matter. And uh, just, a, just a random note, I got my first troll, and I'm just going to mention to my troll, I'm a career educator, and there isn't anything that I haven't heard yet that <laughs> You're going to have to do a lot better because I've heard it all and uh, when you've been teaching for as long as I have, you develop a Teflon for a lot of these things. Good try though. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm very sensitive so I haven't figured out exactly how to deal with the trolls, um, but uh, it's true, it is true. Um, but I am also very much uh, mindful that there is, uh, there are constructs out there that are designed and uh, strategically placed there to undermine and to sort of hurt your feelings or to take away your credibility. So I can outthink it. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, sort of moving us uh, to a conversation that actually allows for um, you know, overcoming identity. I, I think it's a bit of a challenge for, for, for some of us. Uh, largely because I do have intersectional identity. Uh, I am not just a, a woman, but I'm also a, a gay woman, so I'm a queer woman. Um, I'm also an immigrant woman. English is now my predominant language, but at one point it wasn't. And uh, so there's other issues to unpack there. And it's not that I am reminded that I that's who I am. It's because I, I don't get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, oh, look at me, I'm all these identities. <laughs> that doesn't happen. But when I walk into spaces that, that don't have other people who, who are like me, um, then I'm reminded that you know, I, I, I don't quite fit in. But look, there's a chair with my name on it, and uh, take it, because there's a microphone in front of it. Don't know how I really got here, but I'm glad I'm here. And uh, there's, there's a number of other people that I think uh, like to see that there is a person who is like myself, who is not conforming necessarily to that sort of gender binary system uh, that is of a different sexual orientation and that is not necessarily conventional and mainstream, but I am able to occupy space uh, where we haven't occupied space before, and that certainly was the case as the first openly elected lesbian to city council. Uh, so that was part of the so, and, uh, and I do think that it is important for me to sort of say it, own the place, and, uh, and put it out there, because there is some discomfort <laughs> at times, and especially when I'm with some of the guys, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to work together the best that I can, and, and I come at them with a motion and say, hey, look at my motion, and you know, would you like to, to, to second this motion? And they look at me and they're like, yeah, okay, this is a good idea. And then they'll sign off on it, but they didn't really expect it from me, but there they are buying into the politics and buying into the work that we, I'm proposing that we do together. So that's kind of been neat. And uh, it pushes them, and I think it also pushes me. Um, echoing something that Kristen said, I am most conscious of my gender when it seems like other people are conscious of my gender. I am, you know, I'm a policy geek. I like thinking about subways and LRT and school policy and all kinds of things that are not in my mind, gendered subjects. Everyone goes to school and everyone takes transit and they're going to affect different people in different demographics differently, but they're of interest to the whole city. And so it's not something that I think of as a woman, how do I feel about or write about transit? No, I 
take the subway to get to where I'm going, or I take the streetcar to get to where I'm going. And so it doesn't really surface consciously until it feels like I'm having a harder time getting a question in, or I'm getting a different kind of reaction because people aren't quite sure where I'm coming from. And I think it's important not to think of you know this kind of question you know how does your gender come up as well I need to start thinking about the gender questions all the time I'm just going to keep showing up and writing about transit until you get over whatever it is that you need to get over to worry about where I'm coming from and that's it <laughs> wonderful it echoes one of my favorite quotes decisions are made by those who show up so maybe we all continue to show up uh, well, thank you for that, and I hope that gave everybody lots of fodder for what I'm expecting is going to be an interesting Q&A. Um, so I would love to turn it over to the audience for questions. Um, Jessica, just to, I'm not sure, do we have, is, is everyone, do we have roaming mics or is everyone to come here? Okay, so if you have a question, if you can raise your hand. Um, I don't know who wants to be the brave uh, person to ask the first question. We're going to need everyone to come up and speak here so you can... Sh share what it's like. A trailblazer. Yes, and vast. <laughs> okay. What yeah, we'll just need you to speak into the mic because of the live stream. I know it does insert a little exercise into the question process, but I'm <laughs> confident you're all a fit group. Sure. Um, so thank you. Yep, just right here. And if everybody can just introduce themselves and then fire away. My name is Vast Bender. I work at the School of Public Policy and Governance. I have two questions, both of which I've already oh. tweeted. Is this no, I know it's not on. Switch on the mic. Oh, I thought this was just for the Go back. Yes, thank you. Sorry. My name is Vas Bender. I work at the School of Public Policy and Governance. I'm moving to the back. I have two questions. I've already tweeted them, so probably a lot of people have seen them. You guys can pick one or address both. You haven't seen it. The first is I wonder if we're getting a bit confused or misled with sort of like correlation equals causation here. We're looking to public office and saying there aren't, we don't have parity, there aren't enough or as many women in office as men. Uh, ergo, it's because we are women. And the second part is that are we uh, over-focusing on the proportions of women who are in elected office instead of also looking at the numbers that are running? Because to me that's sort of another area worth maybe focusing a little bit um, more on in these discussions. Yeah. If I can just interject, but I'm oh, sure. sure. answer it. Thank you. Yeah, turn that off. Um, and then if anyone else wants to ask a question, just get catch my eye and then I'll, uh, you know, cue you up. Okay, great. And then go ahead, Shelley. Oh, oh. I'm still answer Vass's question. Thank you for that question. Um, I wish I had a nickel for every election I've run in where it was a, a ballot of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Uh, I think three of the five times I've run for office, including the school board, that's been the case. Um, which, is, which is great for me at the door, because you don't want to name your opponents. People say, well, hi, Shelley, who's running? Uh, well, it's me and seven men. And, and that, that generally ends it. They don't say, well, what are their names? Um, but that's kind of crazy that that's what's going on. And this is where we get into the touchy area. Uh, where's Alicia? Alicia dropped a little bomb at, uh, last week and everyone went to, uh, just passed it because they didn't want to think about that. How are we socializing women? It is, it's a, it's a thing in socialization. We get involved. How many of us are happy to get involved in community building and raising funds for causes? How many of us, yeah, I'll raise money for a cause. That my my uh, entry into uh, working in the community was starting the milk program for my, my kid's school. I can raise money for that. Are you willing to stand up and say, I'm raising money for me. You want me. You need me. Write a check for me. Put me in office. We are not socialized to raise money for us and to say we are great and you should back me. That and that's a socialization thing. Some of us are are really progressive in our parenting and really progressive in our youth leadership, and yet we don't know that subtly we keep we keep socializing women to get involved in causes and never to be brave enough to say if we really want to achieve things in this cause. Um, I need to be leading it and you need to help me get there. That's a hard ask. 
Uh, you can, I, I'll get you volunteers for heart and stroke. I just I have a hard time getting volunteers for me. Uh, that the day you get over that is the day you're starting down your path in politics. Uh, there's there's no two ways about it. And uh, women are also afraid of so how are we, to, are we over it and how do we get over it? Well, the first right? thing you it's have to get over it. making me ask, but you also have to get over. We also socialize uh, uh, um, all of our young people. Uh, it's okay to give women a hard time about losing and say, so you're done, right? That was, a, that was a crazy idea, now you're done. Often when you get into politics, and especially if you start young, and you should, you're probably going to have a couple of losses first. Uh, but I don't know why. Somehow in our society, I don't know if it's Canadian or it's, it's Western, but somehow it's okay to say to a woman, okay, well, that folly's over now. Um, it shouldn't be. Uh, Joe Pantaloni was a counselor for 30 years, but first he lost how many times? Uh, yeah, thanks, everybody knows. And nobody said, you know, come on, stop this. Maybe his dad did, but uh, uh, people, people got into a frame of, we're going to do it next time. Uh, you got to be willing to do that, and you got to be willing to say, yeah, I did lo lose, and I know exactly why I lost, and you should write me another check, because going to win next time. Um, there's a subtle uh, uh, patting on the head that's still going on with women, and we all need to be a part of stopping that. Yeah. I think one of the other things to consider is women have to be aware that they need to raise their profile. It's interesting that a lot of our counselors started off as school trustees, or they were part of um, um, the world of activism, and you need that profile. You can't just, you can't just suddenly go from zero to 100. Uh, that's one, one point that I'll make. A second point would be, it's expensive to run a campaign. Uh, I've worked on campaigns in the past, and a lot of it is by the goodness of people who are part of that campaign team to feed the campaign uh, volunteers, to go out, drive, put up signs. Um, the flip side of that would be, I'm a very practical person. I love the fact that our our tax system gives you a very good return if you write a check for a candidate. And there have been a number of times where I wanted to uh, donate, and I thought, well, why not? I'll, I'll see a really interesting return when I do my taxes in, in April. So I think for anyone who's thinking of running as a candidate, social media is your friend at the moment to raise your profile, to make your name known. Um, um, you know, I think that uh, asking women to run for office is, a, is, is noble, um, but also running for, for public office is a Herculean uh, adventure for anybody, uh, especially for, for women and young women. And, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm going to fully agree with, uh, with, with, with Shelley here that you, you need to lose a few times, because we don't have a lot of gas in the tank. I think that we're already stretched pretty thin. And, uh, and I think that, you know, when a good person runs for office, and regardless of gender, and, you know, especially if it's young women, but regardless of gender, when good people stand for public office and they have a chance of winning, like, you need to back them. Because the only way they're going to do it again, or you're going to be able to sort of catch them if they fall, is by fostering and, and, and helping them. And it is unglamorous work, campaign work. Um, and and it's, it's, it takes a lot to step forward to public life, and it takes a lot for anyone who's ever stood for an election, you know what I'm talking about. And there are times where you're standing around going, why did I decide to do this? No one is here, I'm about to lose my mind, I'm broke, I haven't eaten, I haven't slept, and I look like garbage, and I'm still asking for someone, strangers in a humbling way to support me at the subway station. We need to support our friends. We need to support our family. And when we know that we have friends and families or, 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 or activists, uh, allies, who are running for office and you believe in them, then we need to lift up our sleeves, we need to write them a check, and we need to go out and help them and get elected. Because I can tell you right now, as you have all observed, those, that magical number 23 makes a big difference. And we had a brutal first year in office. I was so depressed when I got elected because I couldn't believe the environment I, I found myself in. I'd never found myself in a place that was so polarized, partly because I had never seen this type of politic up front and close and personal. And it was hard. And so not only did I, I work eight months to get, a, to get the job, I got the job and I was like, wow, this is really awful. 
Now, of course, the tide has slowly shifted, and my, my, my attitude and the way I'm feeling has also shifted. But, you know, we have a lot of people who have run for office who are good people who really needed to get in. And then we have people who actually won who, why did they get in? What are they doing for their community? And if we want to change the face of City Hall, if we want to change the face of this country and the way we actually are changing policy, then we need to help people get elected. And that means rolling up our sleeves, taking a lawn sign, taking many lawn signs and dropping them into the neighborhood and, uh, and helping them, whatever we can. And a campaign team is, is many, many people. It's never just five people, it's, it's many people and every little bit helps. Every little bit helps. And they will thank you for that. I've been teed off, I've been tipped yeah. off that there's a debate. No, no, I, 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 I want to um, disagree right back. back. <laughs> no, I, I just, I just wanted to, to, to say that I, I get a little nervous when we, when we talk about the polarization. I know it came as a shock uh, uh, to the first time elected, but mostly because um, in the current administration, we're 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 showing it we're we're showing it right out front and center. But in fact, it's always there because um, here's the deal with politics: debate is actually the gig. That is why you're there <laughs> to to debate things and figure out um, and figure out uh, which of these two positions is going to be the winning one. Uh, we I think we're pretty we're we're pussy cats. You 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 look at the House of Commons in, in Ottawa where they're shrieking at each other and going insane uh, because they have a party system. But what always comes as a surprise as, as, uh, um, uh, as people enter the council chamber is that it's going on there too. They think because we don't have a party system, we're just engaged in our, our you know, getting our neighborhood planning done, getting this done, getting that done. And in fact, we are at, at, at a point in, in Toronto's history um, and I talk about this in my budget talks all the time. As you start to hit three million in the city, you're you're hitting that point where where big changes now start to happen, happen, driven by population. No matter who's the mayor, uh, yellow, green, or purple mayor, whomever they are, we're just about to hit three million, and that's where a city hits a wall. So we have some big changes to make to to make that next leap, and it's contentious. Um, the question is, do we, do we, do we bristle at, at the fact that it's always contentious or do we really, do we burrow down and figure out what each of these positions is and which one I really want? What's the real message underneath? Um, we had, we had a big debate about contracting out garbage. And I'm going to, I'm going to put the audience a little on the spot. I know a lot of you here and, and quite frankly, you all kind of took a pass on that one. This bar garbage is kind of boring. But you know what? Who built, who built pay equity? Who built equity in the workplace for women in this country, in this continent? Organized labor. It's your issue. And we just sort of said, well, that's garbage. We'll let the counselors duke that one out. I'm just saying. I love how our question on do women uh, do women matter evolved into a uh, <laughs> hand so I can see them. Thank you. It's uh, Sonia, Sonia, the project Thank you. manager and perpetual candidate. I think a, a solution would be to actively recruit or, or search for future candidates like like right now, two and a half years before the next election. I believe um, Kristen, you won, and Mary Margaret and Sarah Doucette won on the first try for council and people like Anna Biello and Jay Robinson and uh, Michelle Brardinetti won on their second try defeating people and I guess a couple of them went on to uh, be uh, large members of Ford's uh, larger executive. So I think that might be uh, what we, we got to work towards because uh, things happen like that. Even out in Scarborough when uh, Margaret uh, Bess was uh, a, a candidate because um, the previous incumbent, Marilyn Chambers, stepped down she sought out to find a successor that, that would fit with the personality of the riding. So uh, maybe that's what we have to look towards. And what, what are your thoughts in terms of recruiting people on Twitter or, I don't know, Facebook or even in the real world community-wise? Thank you. 
Well, I, I guess I'll go first. Um, we we had a couple of times in the in the last election where where there was disappointment here. Where um, and and actually, some of you will remember this. In fact, even the the election before that in two thousand and six, when uh, David Meslin was was doing a program, a campaign school, and there's the Maytree uh, campaign school. There, there there are all sorts of things, but. Uh, what Chichi just said is very important. It's what is the profile? Because the reality is, and, and here come the cyber bullies on this one. Last, last week I said something about Angela Merkel and people went on about it for four days. That was bizarre. Uh, I, I kind of whipped up the conservatives on that one somehow. Um, but I'm going to say another thing. The reality is, one of the things you have to wrap your head around in that war, people make a big show about about, uh, oh, do, does she live in the ward or not in the ward, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, to get elected, each of us is in and of that ward. You can't, if you, you can't do a lot of parachuting without having built something on the ground in the agencies in that, in that uh, particular ward, in the causes in that ward, in the serving of that ward. So, we can have campaign schools here in this room. CSI would help us, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, if you're coming out to, to run at, uh, in a ward in Scarborough Rouge River, where are you on the ground out there? We don't have a party system. We're very, very bailiwick oriented in, in terms of how we vote in the municipal election. Uh, as big as the issues are in the newspaper, when you get to the door, it's, hi, remember me, I, I fixed that. That's how the incumbents continue to, to get elected. So taking on an incumbent becomes, what are you doing in this ward? Um, I campaigned years ago for a great woman in Scarborough, Sheila White. I used to call her the actual mayor of North York. Uh, she was for years uh, uh, Mel Lastman's executive uh, uh, senior staffer. Uh, she then went on to, to perform the same role for Howard Hampton for years. She ran for council out in Scarborough because there was an open seat and she's a great woman. But it, at every door people would say, oh hi Shelly, yeah I know you from the parent assembly. Okay, this Sheila person, who are her people? That was neighborhood code for who are her people here in this neighborhood? Because why, why am I going to elect her? So Sonny's right. You gotta decide now you wanna run and then we help you get involved in a particular bailiwick. Can I tell? Um, yeah, just sort of picking up on, on that and some other things a bit. I think it's, it's important to talk about the, the culture that leads us to where we are right now and where we're not right now. And I think it's important to keep having that conversation. But it's also important to remember that politics is a very, very practical skill. It is not theory. It is not art. It is what you do when you get up every day. And we need to build capacity in any community that we want to get more involved in politics. We need to build practical skill sets along with the theoretical understanding of where we are and where we're not. And I think that's something that Toronto is sort of not particularly good at in general. There, there are other jurisdictions where you'll have nepotism, where you'll have sort of clear lines of succession. We don't have that super explicitly here, but it does happen very subtly here. And there is handing of a baton in a ward over and over and over and over again. And the way that you try to get other people into the system is you figure out what those chains are and what those relationships are and what those power streams are and what the practical skills are, you need to expand those. And that is very slow and very painstaking work, but I think it's just important to realize that there is a lot of very, very nitty gritty know-how that we need to pay more attention to and not just the theory of, oh, we need more women, we need to empower women, we need to teach women debating skills and, and these sort of very general kinds of platitudes. Yeah, excellent Khan, I'm gonna take my moderator's prerogative. Um, I was involved in a project where we did a, a very extensive series of exit interviews with former members of parliament from all across Canada. And one of the things we asked them was, you know, why did you do this and how did you get in? And, you know, almost all of them said, you know, I never planned to run. Um, I was asked. 
And when you probe that, there's a few interesting things. So one of them is really, um, because when you look at their backgrounds, they're all extremely involved in what we call the public square, um, which you know can mean all kinds of different things, but it's really, it's your community. But the second one, and, and Hammer told us, picks up on what you were saying, is there's a network out there that's finding people and bringing them in. I mean, they were asked, yes, they've gotten a position to be asked most times, right? And why they don't admit that is a larger comment on the culture of politics, I think, and people's unwillingness to, you know, admit that it's a useful, a useful way to spend time. Um, but there are these kind of networks and and uh, subtle ways. Who, so who's asking you? Who is this person? And so usually someone in your neighborhood involved with a political party. Uh, so it's and how those work. We we actually know very little about. Um, so it's a really interesting point. Reinforced with federal. So now I'll go back to being the moderator. Um, thank you for being, uh, and then I'll add you to the list. Um, and then go ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Adam Chayla Frudenthaler. Um, Shelley, I want to take you back about eight and a half years to <laughs> December 2010. <laughs> December, tw uh, sorry, December 2003. And um, you had just gotten elected, and we had a conversation about what committees you wanted to be on. And you made a really big point about wanting to get on works because you didn't want to get pigeonholed as the education lady who was just concerned about the soft services. Uh, and so I wonder if you could talk about, uh, from a, a gender analysis perspective, why you might have made that choice, if it was strictly just because you had come from the school board, or uh, if you wanted to establish yourself as not just somebody concerned about the soft services, the, the women's issues, uh, but you, you wanted to be taken seriously across the board. And maybe Kristen can also shed some light about how she's approached the choices that she's made about where and how she's chosen to get involved uh, in city business. Um, here's something that will make my, my brothers back at the ranch uh, angry too. Um, I have noticed an interesting thing. I, I had a sense of it in 2003. That was an interesting time because uh, um, at that time we were, were uh, not only trustees going to run at, at, at City Hall in the, in the various open seats, there was one in, in, in one half of my trustee riding, but we were, we were those pretty newsworthy trustees who had taken a stand against the Harris Eves government and said, we're not going to balance the, the budget. And, and so, uh, you know, I had a profile as Uber trustee. I was co-chair of the board at that time uh, uh, under supervision, which, is, uh, which means chairing the board consists of going for lunch with the supervisor and trying to get some information out of him from time to time so that you can hold a meeting. That was a strange time in history. But with that profile, I was conscious of, so I'll, I'll zip over there and ask to be on community development and recreation and everyone will expect that. Uh, they probably already put my, my magnetic thing that they use on the appointment board, they probably already stuck it there. In fact, uh, Mayor Miller had a different idea. He phoned me two days later and said, I need you to be on the budget committee. Um, but I still had to pick a standing committee. Um, and so I said, uh, I want to understand internal services because that's where some savings might be. And I want to understand works um, because I want to be the expert in works. Um, uh, uh, Howard Moscow told me uh, on, on inauguration night that I was going to love municipal politics because it's really all about garbage and shit except we call it solid waste and nutrient management. <laughs> and in a way he's right, that department is where the most money is spent. And, and so you get not only the piles of reports to read, but if you're in that committee, you, you have the, all the oral presentations up front, and so you master that one. And I wanted to make sure that people weren't seeing me as, don't speak to this issue, stick to the soft services when we get to the council chamber. So I walked in knowing that in the council chamber with the whole agenda, I'm in hard service committees, I already have the credibility that if I stand up to speak about the soft services, no one's gonna argue with me speaking about those either. So I went through that whole uh, 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 analysis in my mind and we talked about it because, and, and that's, a, that's, that's your first political risk. Uh, I don't know if Adam remembers, but Adam was asking me that question because there were things he wanted me to tackle in some of the soft service committees and said, why didn't you go in there? I want you to be my champion. Because I know that file well enough that I can champion it for you without even being a member of it. But I, I'm in this for the long haul. 
so I need all the other stuff as well. And uh, I've disappointed you once or twice, but but on balance, <laughs> it's it's those types. Those are the times when you're aware of your gender, when you know that someone will be. What I have noticed in three terms is that when a school board trustee comes into the city. It's a hard thing to overcome for the women trustees that have come over. The men seem to be just taken as, oh, it's his next step. They'll tell me, no, that's not true, but that's been my observation. Chris, your thoughts on the same question from Adam on how you, you chose what to focus on? Well, in 2008, I pulled a little stunt um, in front of Councillor Ford's office. I occupied his office. Um, in, in process of, of some remarks he made, he said, Orientals work like dogs. We work so hard. We're falling asleep beside machines. We're slowly taking over. And it was really the last line that sort of set me off. And I thought, oh, that invokes the yellow peril. That needs a response. So off I went and did some theatrical protests. I think he must have remembered that because when I got elected, um, everything that I wanted in terms of the committees that want to be on I didn't get on <laughs> but you know who knows it's it's just what it is but we're actually getting along a lot better I'm really glad it came to the flag racing um, so <laughs> yes it's true I'm still happy about that because um, it, may, it, may, it might mean you might come out again uh, for the uh, for the pride flag racing but um, <clears throat> so I didn't get on the committees that I want to get on I actually thought I would be pretty good at planning growth management is war 27 is pretty development heavy and I know I have a very strong background in business. So I came from real estate financial services. Like, you know, I spent 18 years doing that, and uh, and I've owned half a dozen businesses. So I thought I'd be good at that. Um, so I didn't get on ECDEV and culture either. But I got onto CDR, which is Community Development and Recreation, which is the soft services, um, which is actually not really my my strongest suit because I worked in the private corporate world. So I'm actually now uh, getting better at that file and actually learning a lot of, about things that I did not know about. Uh, so it's, it's a great place for me to learn and get my feet wet, um, but it wasn't exactly where I thought I would be. Um, so I, you make do with what you have, and I've discovered these things called member motions. <clears throat> and so I now write a lot of member motions almost every single council meeting because I'm trying to tackle the issues I wanted to tackle as, an, as a new councillor, but I don't sit on any of those important committees. You know, those are very important committees. So now I sort of go through the other channel, which is much more open, and I think very transparent, and it goes straight to council. And, uh, and, and she I, has a gift for it. And, and I've, we've got some legislative successes here. Um, so it's actually worked out quite nicely. I don't think it was designed to work out in my favor, um, but it's kind of going in that direction, and so I'm happy where I am. The rules change from you know, <laughs> community magazines not the floor. Um, I'm curious to hear more about how you feel women are represented in politics in the traditional print media. We've talked a lot about social media, but uh, when you have people like Belinda Stronic, where there's a disproportionate focus on personal life versus what they're doing in policy. So, I don't know how many of you were here last week, but former mayoral candidate Sarah Thompson was here. And she spoke about this a fair bit. And I think one thing that we saw in the last mayoral campaign is that there was a felt need to have a woman candidate that people were talking about on the short list of candidates. So there were, you know, 40 some odd mayoral candidates and about half a dozen of them were viewed as serious contenders. And, you know, she had filled the woman slot. And so we checked that box and, you know, we're, we're good to go now. We have a well-rounded election or something. Um, and she, she spoke about some of the things that her handlers told her. So they spoke to her about having a firm handshake. And they spoke about how she should comport herself at debates. And when all the boys were bickering, she could be this sort of motherly presence that was calm and, you know, nurturing or something. And so I think... There's a real chicken and egg question here because how much of this is her handlers responding to things that they were getting in the media and how much of this was them creating that dynamic in the media? That's, that's an ongoing thorny mess. But I do think that as long as we're still having those conversations and women are still worried about their handshakes or their campaign managers are telling them to worry about their handshakes, we've got an issue.
um and now i've been told we have a number of questions uh sitting in our twitter queue so emma who has been faithfully live tweeting is here to uh at least one of them uh yeah that's a question from peggy i'm sorry if i have mispronounced your twitter handle and it's for shiki about the disparities and if gender disparity is a topic that is taught at the high school level that is an excellent question. One of the things that one of my students armed me with before I came tonight was an article that came out in the um, on the internet. It's called Reveal, The Best and Worst Places to Be a Woman. And this is actually a really good way of addressing conversations, especially facts that even not, uh, most of us would probably find surprising. So I'm just going to read them out to you and we'll probably get some reaction. Um, best place to be a politician. Can anyone guess what country in the world that might be? Finland. Lots of answers, but so far, no, none of the above. It's, it's actually Rwanda, okay? And uh, Rwanda is the only nation in which females make up the majority of parliamentarians. They hold 45 out of the 80 seats. I'm just going to do one more because I find this is fascinating. Uh, best place to be head of state, and you may dispute this, but um, so again, best place for a woman to be head of state. Anyone want to guess? Country? It's actually Sri Lanka. Women have run Sri Lanka for 23 years. And then let's do one more. Um, best place to be a journalist. Toronto. <laughs> it's actually Caribbean. Um, it's the region with the highest proportion of TV, print, and radio news stories reported by women. That's 45%. Uh, the worst region would be Africa. 30% of the stories are reported by women. Uh, Europe comes in at 35%. And because this is a, um, a British source, I can't give you what North America is doing. But if we're looking at disparity, we also have to look at um, surprises. We, this proves to me that we can be overly confident about how well we are doing in the world. We just make the assumption that because we are an old core nation, that we are much more progressive, much more um, advanced than other nations. And some of, the, some of the countries that I've mentioned in this list are countries that continue to struggle. Um, most of my students are quite taken aback when I tell them in their lifetime, um, my students are a lot older than typical high school students because I'm at an alternative program, they're surprised that they uh, that Rwanda uh, happened during their during their lifetime. Yet when we, of course, statistics are subject to interpretation. But again, this generates an interesting discussion about our personal image as well as confidence about uh, where we stand in the world. And how do you create trust without sacrificing what you're going for? I'm glad I wasn't asked that question. <laughs> Who would like to start? Sure. I notice it the most on Twitter. Like people who are really uh, campaigning for something will often get called out as soon as they say something more real, like even about a movie they saw or something that kind of detracts from the overall mission. I think it's very important to stay focused. There's a lot of things that can distract you from your goals. And you know, I have staff with me, Melissa Wong is here. No relation. Um, and, uh, and Melissa can tell you that uh, we've got you know 105 ideas flying through the office at any given time, but we have to sort of nail down and say this is where we'd like to be, and then map that critical path on how to get there. And, uh, and it's not always easy because there's a, a number of variables and moving parts that you don't always anticipate, but they kind of come in your way. Um, and I think that uh, it really has a lot to do with uh, just you know keeping your eye on the prize. And ultimately for me, I'm a bit of a policy wonk myself. Uh, I know that policy actually leads to, to better government, I, or hopefully anyways, and it could lead to societal change. Um, so I think keeping the eye on the prize, being very clear about what you want, being very uh, clear about how you communicate that and build coalitions within, uh, there is really, you know, I, I do think that politics can be done differently. I, I have to think that the glass is half full. Um, because I'm going to keep filling that glass. Uh, because if I gave up the hope and said that you know politics is just dirty and it's always going to be dirty, um, 
I, I don't think I can function in, in that space, in that type of uh, environment for, for 20 or 30 years. It's just, it, 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 will, it will not suit my personality. Um, so I think be very clear, communicate, uh, you know, engage with people and, uh, and to build that critical path and not let go and, and, uh, and keep an eye on the prize. Gigi. Um, One of my tweets is in the room. Paisley Ray, where are you? Right here. So Paisley and I have probably spent a total of two hours in real time together. I met Paisley on Twitter through a mutual friend of ours, uh, Graffiti BMX Cop. And if you aren't following um, Scott Mills, you should. It, he's a police officer who works for corporate communications. Paisley's views during the G20 were intense. Uh, she would retweet, but that didn't necessarily mean that she was endorsing anything. And I waited quite a while before I finally started following her. And the, one of the reasons why I started following her was there was a ton of honesty, but at a few moments, um, she also jumped in to offer me suggestions, suggestions that were specific to my students. And if you want to win your heart in and your trust of me, then that's the way to do it. It's not so much about using Twitter to get stuff, it's about building relationships. Um, another thing that I'll mention at the moment, since we're on the topic of, of trust, is um, uh, Scott Mills, aka Graffiti BMX Cops, re a relationship with hashtag Homeless Joe. This is a gentleman who, if you pick up tr the Toronto Star tomorrow um, and you look at the mental health series, um, Riel is going to be the person who is featured um, in the star and through Scott, through Paisley, through a number of other people, I've also been able to meet Homeless Joe in real time. I've also started conversations with his street nurse um, on Twitter, her handle is Anne Marie Batten. I'm doing a lot of shout outs tonight, but that's, a, that's good, I love doing that. Uh, it really is about developing relationships, not using it necessarily as a marketing tool. I have a lot of um, social media specialists, real estate agents trying to sell me things in, pla in places that I have no, that I probably won't go, be going to. Uh, Vegas, Florida, um, those properties are great, but it's not for me. But if you're interested in, in starting a narrative and and showing me a story that gives me a sense of your personality and what you're interested in, that's a good way of building trust. For people who are new to social media, I think that's one of the apprehensions about having an unlocked account and allowing people to see who you are. I can't say that who I am on Twitter is any different from who I am in person. Um, it's just a different side of me. But in terms of those conversations about trust and being open, if, you, if you're not sure, just wait and listen. You do learn a lot by just watching the tweets and seeing if, if, if you want to be part of the conversation and if you want to make a difference. Twitter is a big part of trust now. Um, but, but prior to that, you know, if you're, if you're planning on going in politics, uh, then start right now to be the cleanest person on earth and the most honest person on earth. Um, you know, I, I, I think these will work for, for every, every meeting that you're having, you know that there are people in the room who didn't vote for you. Maybe they don't trust you, maybe they think you're a radical. And, but when I moved in to, to, a, to a grouping where there hadn't been a lot of engagement, and so I said, okay, here's the deal, here are the rules, they're the rules for as long as I'm in office, I'm never going to lie to you. Uh, if I know something and it wasn't on purple paper, I'm going to tell you all about it. You're going to know what I know and we're going to do this like grown-ups for as long as I'm in office. And, and, and I've never veered from that, so, so it, it has actually helped to engage them. Uh, I think a lot of times people move away from civic engagement because they got burned. Uh, that turned out not to be true, and so they walked away. If I'm going to pull them back in the room, I've got to promise them they can at least trust me. The other thing is making sure that I have their trust uh, to be doing things in, in, uh, uh, in the name of making a better city. I'm going to always tell them what I'm doing. I'm not going to go to a spacing party and hide from my neighborhood that I'm at a spacing party because maybe they don't like those kids at spacing. Uh, uh, Twitter allows me to say, this is what I'm doing. 
including when I get on a plane and leave town. Sorry, Sue Ann. Yes, we have to leave town to do business from time to time. And when I do, the minute I touch down, I start tweeting, you damn right I'm in Brooklyn. Look, guess what I'm looking at, guess what I'm doing, guess what time I got up, and now I am at the MoMA. You bet I am. I'm here to see a thing called Suburbia, rehousing the American dream. It's the most visionary thing I ever saw. It's running till August. You should go down there and see it if you can get a deal on a flight or take a bus, it's that good. But I tweet about it because I don't lie. I'll always tell you what I'm doing in the name of representing you and building you a better city. And you can decide whether or not that was a good thing because I'm not going to hide it from you. I have nothing to hide. And you got to brand yourself that way from the very beginning. And then those times when you need to get your community to make a leap with you, I need to make the biggest leap of all. It was the budget chief when we brought in land transfer tax. But by the time I was asking them to do that thing that municipalities in Quebec already do, that municipalities in the United States have been doing since the Depression, uh, by the time I was telling them all those facts, they knew they were true. I don't make stuff up. They knew I did my research because I branded myself as a person who will always tell you the whole story and not make stuff up. This is really what's going on. Now, what do you say? Can you make a leap with me? Will you come with me to make a stronger city? To give broader prosperity to everybody in town and build us a better future? And they said yes. That would have been a lovely note to end on, except we have one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Social media director at Fairtrade Toronto, and we visited you guys at City Hall on May 8th. So, hey, good to see you again. Um, I just have a brief question actually. Um, I was inspired by a couple of things that the councillors on panel said. Um, so, I just wanted to say to Councillor Carroll, um, I am very respectful of your point of view when you said that um, you did come into politics because you're a mom, but you didn't want to be a mommy in politics. Um, but I also wanted to speak to something that. Um, Councillor Wong Tam just said, as um, you had brought up the issue of um, intersectional identity, um, I am a woman of color. Um, as a first generation um, Iranian Canadian, I think that what you said really spoke to me, um, especially given my interest in reproductive health. Um, I think that women, um, women of color, um, refugees, and all of these different things that play into identity really um, are important in this issue of, in this area of policy. So. Um, while reproductive health policy isn't a municipal issue, um, it is something that affects um, all women in Canada, and you did speak to that very briefly about how some of our rights are changing in Canada at the moment. And I'm just wondering if you can kind of speak to what it means to be a woman of color in politics, because there are so few of you, and you are very inspiring, and um, how to engage more women, women of color. Well, do you want to start with the first question first, or? Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll start with the second question first. Question first. <laughs> I was trying to be linear and I all of the things all of the things we're saying about inspiring uh, women to get in politics also have to go double for for women of color and 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 for my money persons of color. Um, I represent Don Valley East. I represent the the Papina. I represent Parkway Forest. Uh, huge Persian community there. Uh, um, by rights, when I'm done being a counselor in Ward 33, this should not be my successor. <laughs> that makes no sense at all. If I've done my job right, if I've engaged the whole community, not parcels and parts of it, but the whole community of Ward 33, then the next counselor there won't look like me, shouldn't look like me. Um, so we have to we have to address diversity in the same way we're we're addressing uh, uh, gender diversity. We have to address uh, gender writ large. Um, but I know that I know that there's something about a woman being in office that doesn't. My I have grandchildren of color, um, and my granddaughter at like a tiny age uh, came in to see me at the office, and 
as, as children do, they, you know, they, they sort of, sometimes I see her imitating her mother, which is awesome because she's actually adopted, so I was like, wow. Uh, and yet she's starting to, to look as if, uh, if uh, uh, the two of them uh, uh, um, uh, share their bloodstream. Uh, but she ran into the office and said, oh, this is where grandma goes. Ran to the desk, picked up a pencil, picked up the phone, and started touching the, the computer keyboard and mimicking me. Um, I know that that's open to her now. She knows that that's a possibility for her. Uh, not because I'm a woman of color, I'm not, but I'm a woman. And so she identified with me as a woman and thought, this is, this is one of the opportunities I got going for me. So that's why, as much as we have to change all the conditions and governance conditions, the numbers do matter. Just seeing the numbers will be inspiring to her. And so uh, 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 we have to keep going on both those fronts. Um, we have to actually speak up and, and, and resist the temptation. I know Barack Obama has made a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, compromises, and so some people are disgruntled. But by God, if you were standing in front of a child of color, do not badmouth Barack Obama. Because of the way media works, that that is a miracle, and we have to keep reminding small children that that's a miracle, is so important. No matter what happens, and no matter what Bill Maher said about Barack last night or whatever, we must continue to talk about what a miracle that is. Because kids look for the big, bold brands, so they might not be looking at, oh, well, we have a woman of color who is a counselor in Toronto Center, Rosedale, but the president of the United States. That's a brand that sticks in the head of tiny kids. So if we're really building who's in government 30 years from now, just keep talking about what a fabulous miracle that guy becoming the president is. Yes, ma'am. You know, I, my, my friend Mark Maloney, who, uh, who, who is a writer and also an ex-politician, uh, Mark uh, recently informed me that um, out of 178 years of, uh, of municipal I don't get the history of Toronto. I'm the 13th person of color to be elected. And, uh, and I found that to be like mind blowing. I said, seriously? And he said, seriously. It was in a, he said, it's true. I published in a Toronto Star article, so it must be true. Um, so he, he, did the re he did the research, and, and I just, I, you know, it really stuck with me. It's like, how can that possibly be? And it's not even the breakdown around gender, it's a breakdown around race. And, uh, and as we, as we put all that together, I think that you know it does make a difference when when the faces of, of, of politicians change and the genders and also the ages and the abilities and the language skills and those who are immigrant status and those who are not um, and, uh, and those who have uh, physical ability and who who, who has limited uh, ability. You know, politics will change uh, because we have to change it. I don't think it actually the status quo is is extremely um, dissatisfying to me. And, uh, and it will change through electoral reform. And it will change through uh, proportional geographical, uh, you know, sort of res maybe perhaps a uh, reservation system of, you know, how do we make sure that the people that are elected are going to at least re uh, reflect the demographic that's out there. And that's a big, bold conversation that we need to take and, uh, and have and take that big step forward. And I don't know when it will take place, but I do think that we're closer and getting closer and closer to electoral reform, especially at the municipal level, a level and especially if we can actually start to broaden um, who gets to vote. So, for example, residents should get to vote regardless of citizenship and status because they're already here. There is no national security crisis at the municipal level. Everyone who, who lives in the city should just have the vote. And I think that would also move things along and change uh, who has access to, to power and who has access to influence and who can shape and change our policy. Um, and I can't, that's going to be one of the most important fights that we have before us if we want to change the way we do uh, politics. Um, and that's something that we have to make uh, a priority perhaps before the 2014 election. I can't imagine us, you know, making the same mistakes over and over again, knowing that the system is not working and is broken and is not represented and, uh, and people are feeling disempowered. We have to change that and, uh, and, and that, that takes courage. Uh, Chi Chi, last word is yours. One of the interesting things about tonight is um, meeting Kristen for the first time, we discovered that we have a lot in common. We, 
there's an age gap between us, so we didn't actually attend school at the same time, but we discovered that we went to the same elementary school in Regent Park, the same elementary school in a gentrified part of Toronto, um, middle school as well, I believe, Earl Grey. Earl Grey. And uh, I think I'm more impressed by the fact that someone who comes from a similar, uh, probably working class background as myself, has ended up where she is, and I think that's fantastic. To me, that is more important than seeing someone who looks like me um, in office. But I've also been tracking her career as a, an activist with the shark fin ban, with um, having the Occupy moment in front of um, Councillor Ford's uh, office a few years ago. I think that's incredible, and I think it would be great to see some of the folks in this room become involved and get into those positions of power in a few years and we'll be able to say that we met you here first when you were just a member of our audience. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, this evening I've been thinking of um, a story somebody told me uh, recently about a building in South Korea that had a big sign on it that said, no change, no future. Um, and I, I think you'll hopefully all agree with me that we are seeing people who are at the forefront of changing the culture uh, of politics in this city, and it's been a real pleasure to get to glom on a little bit as the moderator. Um, so thank you, and everyone, please join me in, in thanking our wonderful panel for such an incredible evening. And I see our wonderful organizer who... <laughs> And I know there's a wonderful team here of people who have put tonight on, and I'm we're looking at the leader, so talk with those who may be at the moment and have to pass over the microphone in a few seconds. Thank you, Allison. Uh, thank you, everyone. This was a really, really great discussion, um, and I hope we all continue this discussion uh, in smaller groups over beer and food. Um, so before we do that, just a couple of announcements. Um, so we have a table that has some buttons. Uh, the buttons are not for sale. It's a pay-what-you-can donation. We suggest two bucks a pop, um, which is simply to recoup the costs that go into putting on an event like this. Um, and also we have a number of booths hosted by amazing organizations that are doing work in the realm of civic engagement uh, and also getting more women uh, to sort of raise their voices in this area. So if you're looking for a way to get involved, I would definitely recommend checking out the booths and talking to them about their work. Um, and finally, just as a reminder, the beer is free, so please drink it. Um, <laughs> and, um, Thank you all for making this so fantastic. Oh, oh, thank you. It's a very important announcement. Uh, a really cool idea came out of our last panel uh, about ward auxiliaries. Uh, so basically a way for people within their wards to have casual meetups and discuss ward-specific issues. We love this idea, and if you love it too, talk to Shantae. You can see her over there. She's got a clipboard. She'll take down your info, and uh, and then we'll keep you posted as this idea develops. So, thank you, everybody, and enjoy the evening.